This is We The Sales Engineers Podcast, show 80. Welcome to We The SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Mejaba. Ramsey is a master at emptying and filling up the dishwasher. Thank you, Ramsey. Hope you enjoy the show. What's up, SE Nation? So one of my favorite things to do is to talk to brand new SEs. Like, it's amazing the energy they bring and their curiosity is just in, infectious. And don't get me wrong, I've talked to many experienced SEs and I've noticed that they love what they do. They're full of energy. But talking to these new folks, the new blood, makes me feel like I'm discovering sales engineering all over again. And it doesn't hurt that I get a lot asked a lot of questions on the way, which that's who are, who are we kidding? Makes me feel good. So works out for me. Uh, so this is what happened with uh, my guest today. His name is Benny Kanungo. He's been on the job for a year. And like he, he has a little bit of experience through, through university and w- the conversation went uh, in the direction like about university, about internships. And we happened to go to the same university. Uh, we didn't study the same thing, but the co-op, format is the same somewhat so it was a fun conversation and it was interesting to see how he got jobs and how he moved from one job to the next uh, to become a sales engineer in the end so um, make sure you subscribe to the podcast or to the email list if you haven't done so already and let's get started with the interview good morning benny Good morning, Ramsey. <laughs> so we just spent five minutes trying to figure out how you how to say your name properly, and we settled on Benny. So thanks for making it easy. Yeah, for me. fair enough. Hey, that's better than most substitute teachers growing up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> your actual name is Benayak Kanungu, correct? And yeah. you're based out of Ottawa, same as me. So we have to yeah. go get coffee sometime because you you work very close to my house. So. Of course, yeah. Beyond what I just explained to the folks, because I just gave them your entire resume, do you do you mind sharing a little bit more of who you are and what you do? Yeah, for sure. So uh, again, as, as mentioned, my name is Benny or Benaya Kanengo. I uh, I am a sales engineer at Ascent Compliance. As you can maybe see behind me, there's a picture of uh, an old mine, and there's probably a picture of some other thing and some trees and whatnot. Uh, so we're a company that helps a lot of other companies with their regulatory compliance matters and supply chain data management uh, matters across the board. And when you kind of bring those two worlds together, uh, so the regulatory compliance and supply chain data management, it really kind of digs into all sorts of different industries. And so I get to help uh, prospects of Ascent over here kind of understand a little bit more about our solution. Um, I myself went to school here in Ottawa as well. I went to Carleton University. Um, full of shameless plug. I don't even benefit really from it beyond just the ego boost, but uh, feel free to catch me on a few billboards and on the side of a few buses here uh, around Ottawa on the old OT transpo system um, because uh, I'm out there <laughs> for Carleton really? University. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you a couple of pictures later. Um, nice. But yeah, I think there's actually one uh, a billboard here by the Valley Village or by the Costco over on Surville. I've been told, and also I guess on Ogilvy, I've been told as well. I haven't seen them myself, but I wanted to check them out before uh, at some point soon. It's pretty much um, where I live. Like, uh, no, I have to go drive <laughs> okay. around looking for your picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, okay, I, a lot of people just tell me that that's where they are, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll point it out to you so you know exactly where to go. Okay. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I mean, not really too much else going on in my life. Just try to uh, find that balance between work and life, and um, you know, I live out in Barhaven, so. Um, there's not always too much going on over there, so I try to explore and find my way out into more interesting parts of the city, I suppose. And uh, yeah, just uh, just getting by day by day. Nice. So you you have like a thirty to forty minute drive every day, based on what you just said. I do. Yeah. And could, because mm-hmm. you work out of an office, your company it's a software like as a service company. Uh, yeah, or at least we're sound cliche, maybe not cliche, but uh, I'm going to spin it up a little bit and say we're software and a service in many respects. So we are a SaaS solution. Uh, we do live up in the cloud and all that, uh, but we do also offer, uh, on top of the software solution that we have, we also do offer a wide variety of managed services as well, um, and even a little bit of consulting on the side as well. And within the world of regulatory compliance, it's such a, it's such a niche field and in so many respects, a lot of organizations tend to hand off the entire function to a sense in many respects. 
Um, so we do have the software to help companies, but we also do have the services as well to run the programs for them. I like that you you have the talking points for your for your company down, but we're not here to talk <laughs> about uh, your company. We're here to talk about you. So right. you didn't start off as a sales engineer. Like you had, I'm looking at your LinkedIn. You had a couple of different uh, positions, whether they're internship or or full time jobs. Can you share a little right. bit more of what you were doing? Yeah, of course. Um, so I would say my my my. I mean, I could go back to my first real job, but. I think my real professional job, I would say, was while I was still in school, uh, while working for uh, Student Works Painting. And for those of you in the Ottawa area, you might be somewhat familiar with, and even around the around North America in general, there's a lot of student painting organizations that are out there. So there's things like College Pro, um, Certa Pro, Student Works Painting, et cetera, et cetera. They're all more or less the same. I don't know. I could give little plugs here and there if necessary. But um, that was my first opportunity to really run a business and kind of get a feel for what that's like to, to, to take on the recruiting and take on marketing and take on sales and take on production and, uh, and even follow up. So customer success after the fact and following up with sales and trying to get referrals and kind of get, getting that holistic view to what business was all about it, within the context of student painting was something that uh, was uh, probably the biggest, biggest eye opener for me. And by no means was I a painter. I didn't really know anything about painting at the time, nor did I really know very much about business. So it's again in my, first year after taking my first year commerce uh, or for a commerce degree, I was just after my first year when I did that or even in the progress of. And uh, so that was my first professional experience, kind of gave me a feel for a lot of different things. From there, um, I was able to take part in a couple co-op terms or I was part of the co-op program at Carleton. Also, I don't know how, what the average demographic is for, for people listening to this, but if you're still in school or looking to get into school, um, there's so many cool options and so many cool programs out there. If you're looking to stay in town though, or even just in Canada, North America, co-op is such an invaluable option for those of you who are looking for a job after the fact, because it gives you that real life experience and kind of beats that paradox of so many entry level jobs requiring experience, but you can't get that experience without a job. So co-op was amazing for that. Um, my first co-op experience was with foreign affairs. It was good, maybe not the most applicable to what I'm doing now, but um, there's certainly a lot of great benefits I got from that time and the people I worked with. Um, the experience I have that's most closely related to what I'm doing now was what I got over at what used to be Halogen Software. Um, I was a market research analyst under the Com market and competitive intelligence team there. Um, had an amazing experience, worked with some incredible people, got some great exposure to, uh, well, to all sorts of levels of an organization, whether it be those I work with on a day-by-day -day basis or those at the C-suite. Um, and then when we got acquired by Saba, who uh, whose name is now in the building over there at March Road, um, even got a lot of visibility to what that whole merger and acquisition process was like and um, got uh, got some great exposure as well to the executives coming in on the Saba side to kind of see how things were integrated. And uh, it was due to a lot of the relationships that I built up over at Halogen that brought me over here to Ascent. And that's a whole interesting story in and of itself that I could get into if we have time. Um, but uh, that's more or less what brought me here now to, well, at Ascent, and when I started here at Ascent, um, I started off over on the product management team um, to serve as a function that was kind of in between the sales team and the product team, but with more of a product focus. And we didn't have sales engineers here at Ascent at the time. And then as, uh, as I progressed in that role, as they found that in the sales role, they really needed somebody like myself, but to focus in on them, as opposed to just me having that as a peripheral activity, they brought me on full time over on the sales side as a sales engineer. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack. Thanks for sharing all that. So my experience as an intern was not great. Um, mm. Like it added value in terms of I have work experience, like you said, but the experience in itself was not fun. How did you find your internship? It was amazing. Um, so the one with the government and the one with halogen were, were similar, but very different in many ways. Um, so there might be some conceptions about government life out there. Um, a lot of them probably true, to be honest with you. Um, I was working with what used to be a uh, department of foreign affairs. It was DFAT D foreign affairs and I don't know, something else that I can't remember offhand. Um, and as it was, this was in my, I guess, second year and I got into this team. Um, it was the business women and international trade team. Um, which was very interesting to me because I did not think I was going to at all get that job. I, honestly, I think there was a girl that interviewed right before me. Um, and I don't know, I don't, maybe don't fit the profile. But 
anyways, um, so I got in over there, and that was a relatively standard experience in the government, but still a little bit different in that it was very, I guess every department's a little bit different around how much, how, how engaging it can be, and that one was pretty engaging. Um, but I mean, while it was very educational in many respects, uh, the people were great, it wasn't really something that resonated very strongly with me. So maybe a neutral experience there. At Halogen, though, had an incredible experience. Um, Halogen Software, have you heard much about them or when they well, were around, did you know much about them? I pass by their office every other day going to work. But okay, I don't enough. know what they do. No. Valid. So, so they handle uh, talent management, uh, so software to kind of help people with, uh, you know, like the Bamboo HRs or the, yeah. I don't know, Ceridians and things like that. So they were pretty much a competitor to that. They had uh, learning management software, talent management suite, recruiting software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so having that focus in on, on people management and uh, the importance of talent at an organization, they treated their people very well. Um, they also were, well, kind of, I mean, for a, I guess that would have been third year at this time, um, there was a kind of pretty much the quintessential company to want to work for. And it may be stereotypical with respect to what a software company does. So. I don't know, I'm a, I was, well, still am really a ravenous kid in many respects, kind of eat whatever scraps I can. Uh, and they had pizza every other Friday, or I think it was even maybe every week potentially. Um, they had snacks here and there as well, um, overflow lunches, so like lunch meetings that they, didn't, they had too much food for. Um, that would always be a common occurrence there. And they always have cool little activities that really brought the, I guess, brought the people together. And I think that's the most important thing about working at any organization whether it be, uh, I don't know, some sort of a corporate organization or even if you're working in a food truck, which is something I've done, the people that, are, that you're working with really make all the difference. And um, the tasks that I had were also very interesting in Halogen, but it was really the people that, uh, that, that really made a lasting impact with me. Nice. So my experience is totally different from yours because I, uh, my co-op was for Nortel. Have you heard of Nortel? Right before they went bankrupt. So I always take credit for them going bankrupt. I say, as soon as I left, they went bankrupt. <laughs> But the people there were just waiting for that to happen or waiting, waiting to get laid off. Like it wasn't really yeah. a great environment to work in. And what I did, ever heard of sanity? Sanity, sanity, sanity checks. Sanity uh, yeah, testing. Yeah. Yeah. So for those who don't know, sanity is basically taking the first, the, the available build and being the first one to test it to make sure it didn't break anything majorly that it will cause the product verification team like to waste their time. So I was doing that on a day-to-day -day -day basis and I got so efficient at it that I was done by noon. And then I would not have anything else to do for the rest of the day. And my proactiveness said, you should go talk to the manager and ask for more work. But when he didn't give me more work, I just didn't do anything. I just read. Like I started reading like <laughs> Python and Tickle, which I don't remember anything Good. from. But yeah, so that's my experience. And I was the campus wow. ambassador for them at Carleton University advocating how great it is to work there uh, and then they went bankrupt as i was saying that it's a great place to work so my goodness I, what was that experience like your layoff experience if you don't mind me asking so i've only ever been through it once and i've kind of been told what it's been like for other organizations but i'm just curious over at nortel what was the maybe the vibe of the organization or what was the overall feeling like among those that uh, that were still there before everything turned to like it's you know? uh, it, it, it was so down like it wasn't a situation where, okay, we're going to lay some people off and then everybody else is like, we're going to be a successful company. They're like, no, we know we're going bankrupt. We're just waiting for the shoe to drop. So hmm. it wasn't really like people would show up at 1030 and leave at three. Uh, right. People would show up at 1030, go for coffee, then go for lunch. Then leave. like, it, it was not, and that, I'm not talking about everybody. A lot of people came early and left late, like, but that's the feeling that I got as an intern. That's what I noticed, especially since I had a lot of hours to just observe considering I had nothing else to do. So. Yeah, right, no kidding. That's such an interesting thing too, the idea that being as proactive as you were, they didn't really reward that proactiveness with valuable activities to take part in. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate to hear. Well, the but funny- Maybe it's pretty, sorry, go ahead. No, so I was saying the funny part is that I, uh, I asked to automate the sanity testing and I actually automated it. And then I provided that information to my manager. He said, no, you should not automate it. You should do it manually. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then by the end of the year, when he was giving me like my final review, he said, you didn't show proactiveness. You didn't automate it. Like, dude, you have the file. You, like, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, it was an interesting experience. Like, and again, it's based, it's people. Like people are different. 
everywhere you go. So right. I, I, a lot of people could have had a different uh, feeling. I just didn't enjoy writing code. That's that's what okay. Right. Did you come from that background? Like going into a role where you had to write code? Had you had experience in that before? Or who's interviewing who? Uh, <laughs> you're doing a good job at it. So I. Uh, <laughs> I came, I was a communications engineer major. So I did coding in university and I enjoyed coding at university because you're building things from scratch. You're doing your own design and all that. But when I went to Nortel, everything was like existing. And the only thing I was doing when I was coding was modifying something. For example, let's say they have a, a module, like a, let's say a laptop that had eight ethernet ports. Now they're coming up with a laptop that had two ethernet ports. I just have to modify the code so that it will not do a check on the other six. Right. Sure. So it wasn't really, it wasn't really a, like any brain utilization. It was just take the code, copy the code, remove the excess. And there you go. You just, you just designed a, cha a, a card basically. So Fair enough. yeah. All right. Back to you. No, that, well, actually, so that actually speaks very interest or contrasts very well with my halogen experience where I'd imagine there where you, like, as, as a student, uh, I'd imagine Carlton, well, I was at, I was at Carlton, but I'd imagine in uh, the field that you were in at Carlton, you're still very excited to get into a role, you know, Nortel's a giant organization. I'm assuming you probably didn't have any sense of where they were going before you joined on with them. Um, or did you actually, sorry, and then I'll continue on. Well, I, I've, I've heard of it. Like, I've, I've heard that they've let people go, like, early on in like 2001 and they weren't they didn't really recover that's what i had heard but i was hoping it'll okay. come back get better right fair well, that makes sense only because uh, it's the only reason i said so actually that even speaks to it even better so that kind of that optimistic feel of thinking it'll get better you're coming into a role and you want to be able to apply kind of some of what you know at school into the role but in a way that also helps grow yourself at least i'd imagine because that's kind of what I wanted to do while I was at both at Foreign Affairs as well as at Halogen. And I would say that at Halogen, I really had the opportunity to take some of what I know, take about what I knew about at school and really apply, apply it in a different context to not just apply it uh, based upon this is what I know and I'm just gonna, you know, I don't know, plug and play what I know into this world, but to even expand that out a little bit and to, um, I don't know, I, one of the things, for example, that I did over at Halogen that was interesting to me was interview a lot of prospect or interview um, one and lost prospects. So those that we just brought on as customers and those that we just lost to, so those deals that were closed lost um, to get an idea to, you know, what they thought about us, why it is that they made the decisions that they did. And obviously being on the competitive Intel team kind of gleaned some competitive Intel at the time. And then after all these interviews, we'd write up reports and uh, recommend actionable insights and all this. And I'm just some kid, you know, from school who's doing all this, recommending things to the sales team and, coming up with some generalizations around the organization. And that was such a cool opportunity to really grow my understanding as to how the corporate world worked with respect to what I was doing in school. And that opportunity contrasts, it seems so strongly against your Nortel experience where yeah. you're just kind of, if anything, whittling down what you did actually know to a very unique use case that wasn't really too intellectually stimulating, um, which is pretty important, I think, for any kid to want to get, uh, to really get into a role and to, to really be, I don't know, attracted to a particular career path. The positive side of me working at Nortel, and although, like I like to focus on the positive, was being able to actually yeah. deal with people who are not in a good state of mind. Like imagine you're Amazing. just sitting waiting for the, waiting for yourself to get fired, or hoping right. hoping to get laid off so you can get your compensation, and then maybe you won't get your compensation if they go bankrupt. So I I learned to like deal with that. So that was a positive thing. I made a lot of friends. I'm happy about that, uh, but. Yeah, like it was a big company, so I didn't have the opportunities that you had. I wasn't exposed to Fair. what they like. How big? How big was Halogen when you worked there? I think there were around five hundred people, maybe like okay. five fifty, six hundred. But yeah, around around five hundred, let's say. Yeah, so that's a lot smaller than Nortel was. Like, totally fair. <laughs> yeah. Good point. So, which is good. Like, it's a good point. If people want to like get exposed to different different types of jobs, maybe they should look at startups or smaller companies. And, you know, you get exposed. It has its negatives. I'm assuming, maybe you didn't you didn't go in uh, you didn't witness a lot of negatives, but maybe people don't want to be exposed, <laughs> right? No, 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 you're you're totally right. There's the pros and cons to any decision you decide to make, and being 
probably having something like Nortel on your resume as well is, is such a benefit because it's, it's universally recognized. Um, I mean, it, it, for, for the positive sides of it, it's, it's, it's universally recognized as being a large organization that achieved a lot. Whereas if you're working for some startup where maybe you have a more, I don't know, robust, or not robust rather, but a wider range of responsibilities, um, it may not be as recognized perhaps. And, and, and even the experience of understanding how such a large organization's function has so many great benefits too. Um, because you get to see that and you're not really exposed to that same degree of uh, a structure, I suppose, at a smaller organization. So I guess in either situation, lots of pros and cons that can be taken from it. And I kind of love what you said there, focusing on the positives, because in many respects, a lot of my, well, I consider myself being delusionally optimistic in many respects. So to hear from you um, as well, and, and that's such a great way of framing it, the way that you did, that's, uh, that's really cool to see. Well, I'm happy you're delusionally optimistic. I am, I am, people say I'm pessimistic. I consider myself a realist. But okay. I work hard on like focusing on the positive things because I never learned anything from being negative. It just brought me down. I, I, I did want to ask, what was your first gig out of university? My first gig out of university, it would have been working at Halogen. Um, so okay. I got hired on full time. I think I was either on contract before I got hired on full time. I don't really remember the cadence of when I graduated to when that took place, but it would have been at Halogen. All right. So like you kind of had a job set up before you uh, graduated university. More or less. Yeah. I forget exactly how it went down. Um, I know that they have a rule or they had a rule at Carleton stating that you couldn't end your degree on a co-op term. So um, my, I had eight, eight months of co-op there and then I went back to school for the last semester. And then afterwards, I, I don't remember if I tried to look for a job. I must have at least tried to look for a job naturally. Um, I don't know about you, I hate looking for jobs. The whole idea of, you know, writing up a cover letter and uh, writing up a resume and then going through the whole dance of interviews and all that, uh, it could sometimes be a lot. And there's stories from that too that I could probably tell. But um, I think I eventually reached out to my old boss, kind of asking her, hey, you know, looking for a job, are there any opportunities that you know may be out there? And then uh, ended up bringing me on on contract. Uh, yes, I guess that's exactly how I went down. And then okay. after that, I got hired uh, on full time. So imagine that you got your first job through contacts, not through resumes. And who you know, what you know is important, but who you know is uh, is a little bit more important. <laughs> yeah, I spent four months after graduation because I was promised a job at Nortel, and then it went bankrupt. So obviously there was no job there, but I spent four months after I graduated looking for a job, four to six months. And the way I got the job was I met someone at a picnic who worked oh, cool. at Alcatel Lucent. And I was wearing my Nortel shirt because I was the campus ambassador and I like to wear branded shirts. And hey, we, why not? <laughs> we got into conversations and uh, like, yeah, I don't want Louis Vuitton. I want Nortel. <laughs> so good. So, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, that's how I got, I got the job by meeting someone at a picnic. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> well, Super, most, yeah. I've only got one job through resume. I've gotten interviews recently, like last year before I moved uh, to my current company, I got a lot of interviews through my resume, but the jobs that I've received were always through contacts. Right. So no, it definitely makes sense. I guess from both, uh, from both perspectives, like from the organizational perspective, it's nice to, to know that somebody that has already kind of made it through the process is recommending somebody because like people tend to attract like yeah. people. Um, and then from a, from your perspective, or as a, any candidate perspective, it's kind of nice to have that social proof of the fact that, hey, this person that I know is not, you know, totally deranged. So I probably want to, uh, maybe I could probably trust their, trust their judgment. And the big thing that people should know is most companies, I don't know about all, but most companies actually offer a kind of a incentive for people to recommend yeah. other people. Like my company <laughs> offers whatever, 600 bucks, whatever it is. I don't even know for me to refer someone into my company and if they last for six months i get a bonus so it's not it's not like you're they're doing you a big favor they're getting paid by their own company for it as well that's so. true although you can argue so you're 100 percent right that there's definitely no disputing that but um i would i would even argue oh i wouldn't argue anything i would also say though that there could also be a personal incentive for that person like here at halogen or halogen sorry here at Ascent rather um, there's so many, well, there's one person in particular that I referred that got hired on. Um, he's since left to start his own business. Uh, that's going super well, but in the time that he was here, I don't even, I'm sure I did get paid the referral bonus. I never actually checked my account or whatever for it. However, um, he's one of the, I don't know, 
definitely, I just love the time that he was here working with us because I was a close friend and we just had a lot of fun while working together. And, um, and having that type of experience, I think, even further, let alone having a lot of friends at work, but to have somebody in your personal life who is already a friend, um, to say for that type of person to come into work as well, and then kind of, I don't know, build upon that is, uh, I don't know, that, that was a lot of incentive for me personally. I yeah. But yes, you're right, the financial incentive, it's hard to dispute that. Yeah, I, like I'm just, I'm, I, what I'm saying is that for people who are shy about asking for referrals, sure. just know that they could be rewarded for it as well. Like, don't be extremely shy. So Good point. you've been an SE for, let me check, a few, almost a year. Almost a year, yeah. I would say in an official capacity. Um, while I was on the product team here, I was kind of maybe playing a pseudo SE role, but yes, essentially for a year. Were you voluntold to become an SE or did you choose to become an SE? Um, you could say I maybe bit A, bit of B, but I guess the, ultimately the, the decision was mine. And um, there were different financial packages that were associated to, or compensation packages that were that, that were associated to either. So, um, and also just with respect to what my natural skill set and maybe uh, ideal progression path looked like, um, at least with respect to the skills I wanted to develop, the SE path was more attractive to me. Um, so I was maybe recommended to be, and, and but ultimately chose it. Right. So what do you like about it? So um, there's a lot of things, goodness. Um, one of the things I guess most selfishly that I like about it uh, is how it allows me to develop personally. Um, so from this conversation, I think maybe we mentioned it beforehand as well on our previous phone call, but, uh, and anybody I ever tell this to, they always laugh and don't believe me, but it is actually true. Um, naturally, I'm not at all this outgoing, or I don't even know if I am outgoing right now, but naturally I'm a very relatively shy, introverted, uh, reserved person. And so having the opportunity to, to do something like this and to be a sales engineer where I get to kind of be that, that communication conduit between uh, whether it be the prospect and even in many respects, different aspects of the organization, whether it be say product management, sales, um, customer success, and to be able to convey that value back and to be able to work with so many different people within the organization really helped me develop that skill. And I would say this really started off over in that student, on the, in my student painting days when you had to kind of go out and cold call and do sales and stuff. And it definitely helped me become a practiced extrovert in many respects. Um, but here as an SC, I get to do that in, in a little bit more of a professional capacity. And I still get to marry all of the technical, maybe knowledge that I've been able to attain here at Ascent and still been able to maintain those relationships with people on the engineering side while still being able to engage so much with these salespeople who I also love here. And so, um, it was just a marrying of so many different things I wanted, whether it be development of personal skills, so communication skills and being a little bit more outgoing, um, the maintaining of relationships with those that I didn't already have as much here at Ascent and those that I already did. Um, and also, well, to be honest with you, the opportunity to travel is pretty cool too. So uh, being able to go around on different on-sites and being able to visit prospects in person and see their offices, and see the different places around well, so far in North America uh, was pretty appealing to me. Nice. Like some people think of uh, travel as not so positive, depends on where you are in your life. So it's interesting how different jobs work for different people. So what is your day-to-day -day like? Day-to-day uh, -day like, so it'll change from day-to-day. -day. <laughs> All right, week to week. Uh, yeah, fair enough, week to week. So, um, so we just did, I, I, I want to preface this by saying that we did just hire two new sales engineers um, a few weeks ago. So my day-to-day is going to be changing, or week to week is going to be changing a little bit, but in essence, um, the way it's been is that maybe I have, let's say, two demos a day, uh, give or take. There's some prep involved for those two demos that I'm actively involved in. Um, that's just maybe on average, more often, actually maybe a little bit lower than average, but um, let's, let's just say that for now. Uh, then there's also demos that I'm supporting, whether it be by building something for uh, prepping an environment for, um, and then also following up to ensure that the salesperson is ready to work with the, the resources I provide to them. Um, so managing all of that, um, there's a lot of also kind of working with different departments. So maybe some meetings with product to kind of get an understanding as to what's coming up or a new feature that uh, that's going to be demoed or speaking with marketing to, uh, to collaborate on a webinar. If I'm doing that a little bit later on today. Um, uh, so that's something else. Uh, sometimes meeting up with CS and kind of understanding what is it that we, uh, that, that we're currently able to offer to a customer based upon their current capacity. Um, so those are maybe the, the general activities and really it's a whole mix of, um, of all these things happening kind of one after another. 
Um, oh, there's also a lot of meetings with regulatory as well to get an understanding as to some of the regulatory changes and some of the best ways to frame a certain thing. Um, if I'm traveling, then there's obviously the old great, uh, you know, trip to the trip to the airport and doing a few demos from the airport uh, to be able to support calls. And nowadays with the three new sales engineers, there's a, or two new sales engineers rather, uh, there's a lot of training involved as well. So getting them to shadow calls, um, reviewing their calls, providing feedback, uh, things like that. Um, Nice. Oh, and a lot of eating food when around. <laughs> when <it's> around. <laughs> oh, <man. All> right. <laughs> so you've been doing this for a year. Like, what are the challenges that you faced since starting as an official sales engineer? Yeah, no, good question. So I would say the the biggest challenge. I mean, yeah, I guess challenge is is uh, is maybe a relative term. It's not a challenge that I haven't welcomed. Uh, but the biggest challenge has probably just been capacity. Um, so until three weeks ago, um, and then for a brief two-month period outside of that, um, I've been the only sales engineer servicing about, I don't know, 35, 40 salespeople uh, here at the organization. So uh, so as you can imagine, capacity, I, I could be spread out pretty thin from time to time. And they've all been pretty understanding as to the fact that I am the only one <laughs> working for yeah. them, but uh, working with them. But, uh, but that, that's probably been the biggest challenge. But it's also been a welcome challenge in the sense that I mean, I didn't even know what regulatory compliance was before I started here. And so a lot of these organizations, uh, really like everywhere around us, the, the regulatory compliance is a thing, like from the clothes we wear to the products we use, the cars we drive, they all have to abide by some sort of a regulation in order for them to be sold, whether it be by not having, let's say, so much lead or some other terrible substance in there or by being certified in a certain way. And so by being able to work so often with so many different types of sales reps on so many different types of deals across different industries, again, as you can see all there, um, I've been able to learn so much and it's been something that, um, again, that I've really enjoyed, but the biggest challenge again was probably capacity at the time. So how did you deal with that? Like, I know you said everybody was understanding, but yeah. a lot of times you probably have to tell the sales guy, like, I can't do your meeting today. I have to do it. The other dude's meeting. So yeah. how did you deal with that without pissing people off? So, no, great question. Um, I think it really comes down to the people I, I, I have the, the opportunity to work with here. Um, Ascent is a relatively small, growing extremely quickly. Uh, I mean, we're not even that small anymore, realistically, but I think we're up to like 550 or 600 people. But here in Ottawa, in this office in particular, is relatively tightly knit. I think there's maybe like 200 something people. And uh, and it's all open office and we're all very much like there's some people like there's varying ages and whatnot but we're all very much on the same wavelength with respect to um i don't know just being a very not similar personality type but we're all just very much on the same page with a lot of things so um i don't think i've ever seen anybody when i tell people like hey you know i got to work on this deal because it's you know there's these other things going on and um unfortunately i can't really help out with yours but i can you know maybe help out in a future call um, nobody's ever really been pissed off. I do get teased sometimes where like with some reps who, I don't know, they're amazing people will tease me about uh, saying like, oh, of course, Benny, you're going to bail on me again because that's just what you do. But with love, again, it's never like a, there's never any malicious intent or anything. Uh, I think just having that mutual understanding among everybody involved has been, has been the key piece there. Okay. That, that seems to be like different, uh, different places might not be as uh, loving as it seems your, your company. So that's that's a good thing to have uh, i'm guessing so i just if someone else is running into that same situation how do you propose they deal with it yeah no great question i mean it, obviously every situation is going to be a little bit different um i think in the end though i mean you have to recognize you're only a person um and if you are the type of person that already is putting in a lot of extra work. Uh, maybe you're, you're staying up, you're waking up early doing calls or you're staying up late doing calls and doing all the other activities that are beyond just the scope of, uh, of demos. So who knows what other admin activities or other support activities an SD has to do in your particular, or in their particular role. I think that there needs to come a point where you recognize why it is. I mean, there's a lot of intuition, I think, initially with respect to understanding why it is that you need to focus in on a certain activity versus another. And then, I mean, SDs are really great at conveying value and kind of, well, I think anyways, conveying value and speaking to different people and different types of people and, and, and yes, different types of people. And so to be able to explain to them that intuition that you have as to, hey, you know, this is really important. I, I understand why you're asking me to do this, but, you know, I'm limited to only doing, or maybe I only have so much time to achieve a certain thing. And this is this activity that 
has been brought upon me and is so important because of reasons X, Y, Z. Um, just being able to explain that, I think, is, is the most important thing. And again, I'm kind of speaking from a point of naivety because I haven't really faced um, too much challenge or too much of a challenge uh, in this world. But I can only imagine that the person that you're, you're letting down, quote unquote, they have to be able to understand. Um, and if they don't understand, I mean, that's probably another conversation that needs to happen to say that, hey, you know, I understand you're upset, but like, what do you want me to do here? What, what would you do in my situation, you know? That's, only, that's the only thing that I could imagine uh, could take place in that situation. Probably not too helpful, I'm sorry. No, it's pretty good. Actually, I do this all the time with like, or at least I used to with my previous sales guy where everything's a priority. We're working on seven different opportunities, seven different proof of concepts. Everything's priority. And I come to, I write everything on the board. I'm like, which one, like, I have this much time. You want me to do all this? Which one do you want me to work on first? And like, right. that kind of t- usually takes care of that thought process that everything's priority. No, not everything's priority. Everything or everything is important, but we have to pick a priority. It's not priority. It's, right. it's priority. Do, do you feel like, so you're not, you didn't study engineering at Carlton. I did not. Do you feel like that gives you an advantage in your role or a disadvantage? Um, good question. I would honestly say neither in many respects. So the role that I'm in right now, I'm fortunate, doesn't require, it didn't really require that much code or really any coding um, at all. So coding is in like in a specific language. Um, the, like I've always been a math person to some degree. I shouldn't say always. I think I, up till about grade 12, I guess I was a pretty good math person in the first year of university. Um, but the only reason why I say neither is because this role right now kind of has me um, really not even explain the, the nitty gritty of, uh, of the engineering behind a product. I mean, there are people here that can have those conversations. Um, but all that I ever really need to do is just convey value and give people a sense of how things work and, and why they work a certain way. Um, and so kind of having or not having an engineering background, I don't think has really worked uh, to, um, or rather here, let me put it this way. So not having an engineering background has its benefit or um, has its cons in that perhaps I can't really explain, um, well, I guess I've, I have learned it since, but before I maybe knew how APIs work, I couldn't really explain how that worked um, to somebody on the other side who was more technical. I've since uh, remedied that and I have since learned it. Uh, so that would have been a pro had I been an engineer. But then on the flip side, coming from a business background, um, the benefit of me having that focus in on business was to be able to have more valuable conversations on the business side and to be able to relate more strongly to the salespeople I'm working with, which I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do had I had an engineering background. So really pros and cons. And I think that once you get into the role, uh, it's really up to the individual to start to learn what is it that, or rather to identify those gaps in their understanding and to, to address those as necessary. So what I want to add is that the fact that you're most engineers have communication issues, like we're not the best at communicating stuff because we're all about ones and zeros, like straight to the fact, the fact that you studied business will actually not just allow you to communicate better with your salespeople. You can communicate better with, better with your customers who are also not engineers, correct? In many cases, yeah, and, and sometimes there are some engineers that, that come on and directors of engineering or quality, whatever it may be. And so while I could have that surface level conversation with them, if there ever is a need to get much deeper, um, and there's all sorts of documentation and leveraging people and uh, leveraging the resources around you is such an important skill to have. And SDs are such great conduits, at least again, I have a pretty short view of what, a, what an SE is beyond, I mean, your, your podcast has helped quite a lot in expanding that, but from what I understand, SEs have their arms in almost every department or have contacts across the board. And uh, I was just listening to the one with, uh, with Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson, Dwayne, Dwayne uh, Johnson, that's I'm the rock. <laughs> Dwayne <Okay. De> Silva. <laughs> Silva, right, 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 not that. Yeesh, it's still early. Anyways, uh, he was saying that idea that, you know, or maybe you said it on the podcast, the idea that those people know, you know, who the people are that need to be connected with. I think you were actually saying this because you were in support and somebody was saying that, uh, that you did such a great job and all you did was connect them to the, to the right answers. Um, I think that's a yeah. big part of what sales and yeah. yeah, that's true. Leveraging is a skill. Like a lot of uh, SEs that I work with have a problem. They want to do everything themselves. Like they're control freaks. They want to do everything themselves. They don't want to get people involved. But if you can leverage people and have them do some help you out, you can be in so many more places at the same time. So yes, that's a very good point. It is time to move on to the not so fire round. 
which is okay. the four questions okay. I ask almost every uh, guest. I've I change them up a little bit every once in a while. I change one on you. Uh, so you're in for a surprise if you've listened to this in the past. So we talked about what you like about being an SE, but is there one thing that you just love about being in that role? Ooh, one thing I love about being in the role? Oh man. Um, honestly, the thing I've loved the most so far is probably the travel. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big sucker for that type of thing. I love the idea of flying in planes. I love the idea of going to new places. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're from Ottawa. For those of you not in Ottawa, we get some pretty decent winters here. It's pretty nice to be able to see grass and to feel the sun on your skin after not being able to do that for about eight months at a time. So that's a pretty, uh, probably my favorite thing. And there's so many amazing things. So that's probably the one that, uh, that stands out. Yeah. So I'm married. I have a wife. And if I travel when it's snowy here and it's sunny somewhere else, <laughs> I pay for it. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm just Good warning point. you for the future. <laughs> No, very true. That's a good, that's a good insight. All right. So what but is? I would the... also say. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was going to say like that. That's also a pretty general answer, just with respect to any role that involves travel. I think though, with for being an SD though, something that's unique to being an SD is that ability to speak to customers and, and provide them value. And who doesn't like making people happy? So to be able to provide a service and or a solution that really helps people is something that I really like. And also, you know, you don't well I'm, in my role anyways. I don't really have the pressure that an account executive has to really make the sale. So I'm just there to be that helpful person that um, that, that that tries to provide value. And if it doesn't work for you, I mean, that's too bad. But yeah. uh, also, no get off my back. <laughs> nice. All right. So, what is the one thing you would change about your job? Um, I was actually so because I know this is a question that you you've asked before, and I I have been struggling to kind of get an answer until I listened to the one with Dwayne De Silva <laughs> a little bit so just earlier today. It's honestly the administrative activities. I hate admin admin activities. They are necessary. It's a necessary evil. Um, but uh, and, and there's a lot of great benefits that come from it. But yeah, I just I, I hate it. Name one. one. You're you're you are optimist. So name one yeah, positive thing that comes out of administrative activities. I dare you. Oh, I love the uh, so I, lo I love the outcome that comes from it. So being able to 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 track metrics and so I use Excel. We use Salesforce here to track a lot of things, okay. but I also keep a separate sheet in Excel myself because um, there's just more so much you could do with pivot charts and tables and whatnot that really allows you to slice and dice data however you want to based upon whatever data or the structure of your data. So. Um, I love being able, so I hate putting in the data, I, I hate that part, but I love being able to go into my graphs afterwards and, you know, update how much, uh, how many dollars have I contributed to the company or how many of this have I done or how many hours okay. have I spent. Yeah, so I don't do any of that. It's all on Salesforce, so I don't, like I track it on Salesforce, I don't do anything through Excel. Maybe I should. Okay. Well, no, I mean, this also speaks to my lack of knowledge about Salesforce. There's probably a lot of things in there that, that, that can maybe emulate what I'm doing in Excel, but um I don't know. There's also some limitations that I'm aware of that yeah, uh, yeah. allow me just to do what I want in Excel. Yeah, like it's not perfect, but you know, sure. neither is Excel too. So, but it, if okay. it works for you, oh, it's right. good. All right, sure. third question: Is there a book or resource that every sales engineer should be exposed to? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, one resource for sure, I would say. Uh, actually, though, um, it's probably this podcast, or, or at least your site, rather. Um, so your site is really good at offering a lot of different perspectives from sales engineers around uh, around industry, uh, around various industries rather. Um, they make mention, especially in these questions, they make mention of a lot of books that are great to read and you have a lot of, all your notes kind of uh, lay those out. And I think that's excellent as somebody that's new to the world of sales engineering. Um, from here though, I mean, I'm not the best at this world. I'm just starting to get into reading more business books that I've been talked or uh, I guess recommended to me. but. Um, I can recommend some books that I've read that have been helpful, but uh, it's really up to whatever, however people best learn. I mean, I can't really say. Okay. So what, what is the book that you're reading or you've read that helped you as yeah. a sales engineer? Um, so I don't even know if it helped me as a sales engineer particularly, uh, specifically, but there is that one book that Chris Hadfield wrote about his experiences kind of being an astronaut and all that. And the reason why that was a very just cool book to read was that I don't know, I'm, I'm a big space nut in many respects. And so, um, it, it's cool to be able to hear it from someone that you respect, like uh, like Chris Hadfield, who's done so much, and um, to kind of get that perspective of the fact that hey, like you know, there's so many things going on down here, and uh, one thing in particular, I think that there's so many points that he kind of highlights throughout the book, and 
I think one that's really relevant to sales engineers is in, in some respects, you know, while we are so busy sometimes, is uh, it's not to, not to sweat over the little things where you can maybe get super stressed out of all these different things going on. And being detail oriented is very important to ensure that you are obviously providing the best product and the best, the best um, I don't know, the best service you can to your customer sales or, or whoever else you're working with. Uh, but all the while, you know, if you have been doing it for so long, if you do have a certain uh, maybe reputation that's been built, if you are um, maybe expected to do a certain quality of work and that's just your natural style of doing things, don't stress out about maybe how something won't work out because it probably will. And uh, that's one thing. Uh, perspective around the fact that, you know, we're all just contained in this little blue dot um, is pretty cool too, to not get too stressed out about, let's say, that deal that's happening next week that you're not really too hashed out as to how it's all going to work out. Um, you know, it, it probably will. Just, just do you. And it, it'll typically work out. And that's probably my delusionally optimistic mind speaking, but, uh, uh, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's good, bro. Hey, it, it's worked out for you so far. So, so you're far. speaking from experience, right? <laughs> and the book, is that the astronaut's uh, guide to life? Um, it could be, to be honest with you. I have no idea. It was a few years since I last read it. Um, <laughs> okay. Right now I'm reading that uh, Never Split the Difference book, which is actually really good as well. Yep. Um, more so just a general business book rather than just for SEs. But um, yeah, I, 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 I could send it to you alongside sure. that. Uh, well, there, <laughs> there are pretty much two options. There's You Are Here and there is the Astronaut's Guide to Life. So... I'll put them both. Probably is the guy. Yeah. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, right I'll, I'll link them both. Like I already, we mentioned okay, both, so I'll, I'll, I'll link them both. All right. So All right, yeah. in your opinion, I know you're new as a sales engineer, or at least you've been saying that. Although, yep. so what do you think separates the great SEs from just the okay ones or the good ones? Ah, huh, that's a great question. I mean, it's hard to say. I'd like to imagine that the things that could potentially lead me to becoming a great SD. Um, I think that maybe just speaks to just people in general. Um, it's to always be learning. Um, I could imagine that I hate to stereotype or profile, but I know like engineers, they, they they can know a lot rather sales engineers, engineers in general, know a lot of things about just a lot of different things or know a lot about some certain topics and it can be easy potentially to get arrogant. Um, I know that from also a previous podcast of yours, a lot of sales engineers, and hey, I had the same feelings too when working with sales reps um, that also can sometimes fit a profile. A lot of people think, especially on the engineering side, that hey, like, who are these people, these clowns doing these things? Not actually clowns, they're obviously amazing people, but I get the profile. Um, yeah. And like, I can do that job, you know, what it, uh, things like that. However, they, it, it's really easy to get arrogant kind of in that mindset to, to not really recognize what it is truly that they're doing and the types of people that they are that are in these roles and who they actually are and to to always be curious and to always be learning and to always be humble, I think is probably the most important thing because sales engineers do convey a lot of value. They do provide a lot of value having so many connections that they do. Um, and I, I think it'll, it's very important for anybody in any role um, of relative power like that to not, to not get caught up in it and to always recognize maybe what got them there and what allows them to be good and what allows them to maintain great relationships with those that they work with. Um, and so that's, that's the mindset that I'm taking on. I've learned so much while here. I continuously get to learn so much about those that I work with, uh, who I already thought I knew somewhat. And uh, I'm always learning so much more about what I could be doing to be better. So that's what I would say to be great. I have no real context, though, beyond that. Uh, beyond that, that's what I would recommend. What about you? Again, you've had so much more experience than me. Uh, or am I allowed to ask that in this round? I'm not sure. Yeah, you can. Ask. Well, it's a not so fire out, so we can do whatever we want. Uh, cool. I think self reflection, <laughs> it kind of comes back to what you were saying, but I think self reflection has a lot to do with it. Like figuring out what you need to work on, like what you're bad at, what, you, what you're good at, and just work on getting better, basically. It's wanted. I feel like wanting it is the most important thing. You want to be great versus the status quo. So. Right. Yes. No, you're right. 100%. All right, man. Well, how can people find out more about you? If people want to reach out, ask you questions, ask you to yeah, mentor them. Sure. <laughs> oh, man, it's poor story. Sorry, soul that ever asked me to mentor them. Um, so uh, I guess uh, the easiest place is I don't, I don't really have too much going on. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the, the best thing for now. Um, although I do have a question around LinkedIn, which I don't know, maybe I, I struggle with how this should be handled. Um, when people send you invites, do you just blankly accept them all or do you try to vet those? Because personally, I kind of vet things. I don't really like, you know, being connected to somebody and then somebody asks, oh, hey, it's you're connected to so-and-so. How do you know them? And I was like, I don't know. I just accepted them. 
Um, what's your or like, what's your thinking around all that? Well, I, I used to vet a lot, but now because I'm running the podcast and all that, people just reach out to me. A lot of them, like I prefer it when someone sends a note of why they're right. connecting with me. Uh, a lot of a lot of people don't, but I right. like, generally speaking, I look at what they're doing. A uh, briefly look at what they do. Like if they're in my industry, I would accept. If they're in a totally different industry or I don't know them, I would consider it at that time but before i started yeah. all this yes i was really uh into like i didn't like uh, well i don't have facebook i just started twitter like i'm not the guy who would wants to connect with a lot of people for no random for just a random reason i want to be intentional yeah. in what i do so that's okay no i like that I, I, that's perfect um i'm the exact same as you to be honest i don't have a twitter either or instagram and all that and probably had some I don't know, some detriment to, to, to being in my generation on having these things, but I couldn't care less. Um, for LinkedIn though, yeah, no, highly recommend people to re reach out. Uh, so I guess it's linkedin.com slash in slash Vinny Canungo. Uh, so it's B-I-N-I-K-A-N-U-N-G-O. Um, but yeah, please throw in a note uh, for those that do reach out because uh, I'm still at the point in my life where uh, I sometimes do like to vet things. But if I do, if you do mention that you heard me from the podcast, more than happy to connect. Um, also, for those of you in Ottawa, or even if not in Ottawa, I don't even know if this is the case, but I'd imagine that it could be, uh, you know, keep an eye out for various billboards and bus ads on the outside of buses around the city. Uh, you might have a face uh, like mine on there talking about something to do with being passionate about uh, about being in Carleton. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's probably out there. And uh, yeah, besides that, you know, not uh, not too much else going on, at least from a professional networking standpoint. But uh, yeah, maybe something in the future. Yeah, no, that's good. I do have a Twitter now for the for the podcast and websites. Oh, cool. But not a personal okay. one. All right, man. Uh, I know you're busy. It's uh, you need to get back to work. I I think I I received a call from a customer already, so okay. I oh. gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Hey, thanks so much for the opportunity. This has been amazing. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Vinny. Of course. Anytime. Take care. Well, this was fun. I don't know if you guys agree or not, but I really had fun talking to Benny, and I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Um, Benny, I know you listen to this. If you if you don't, shame on you because you said you do. But I wanted to thank you for coming on the show and for bringing your insight. It it was just fun talking to you, and although you've been on the job for a year, you actually provided a lot of information which could be helpful for a lot of people. So show notes are on the website and you can find them at we, the sales engineers.com slash show 80. Thank you all for listening. If this uh, episode or the podcast in general have been useful to you, please make sure you uh, share with folks, you know, or leave a rating or review or subscribe, like just help spread the word, help more people see this because it is uh, in my humble opinion, which if you know me, it's usually not very humble. It is a good source of information. Anyways, now with that, I will see you guys next week. So this is Ramsey signing off.